school. And I'll also give some of the lectures. Um, so the formal inauguration today is a holiday in Jamia. So the formal inauguration will happen tomorrow at 9.30. Okay. And um, there is a slight change in program. Actually, today the last lecture was supposed to be some computational package by Professor Refrizer. But he arrived late yesterday, very late night. So we thought that uh, he just gives the lecture tomorrow. So there is a just interchange. The last lecture today, which was the supposed to be the uh, computational thing, that will happen the last lecture uh, tomorrow. Okay? And today I'll take that lecture. And uh, tomorrow the first lecture will be the weak lensing one. Okay? The second lecture will be density perturbation. And the third lecture will be this today's computational tools. And today, the third lecture uh, that I will continue. I will have one cosmology course lecture, so that I will continue to the third lecture. So that is a small change. So uh, we have Professor Sanjay Jingan, our officiating director. So I ask him to say a few words, and then we can start. Well, I informally welcome all of you here, because tomorrow you'll be welcome formally. So, well, you are very lucky because when you want to run any art, I mean, it's very in your opinion that you learn from a master. And here you are the master himself. And weak lenses <laughs> is uh, based on the, one of the oldest tests of GR, the bending of light. And I'm sure in many of the cosmology lectures you have seen very beautiful arches. But they are strong lensing ones. I mean, weak lensing is really an art. And how it is done, how the game is played, I think you will learn in these lectures. So I welcome all of you here and welcome to Mr. Alexander to the series of lectures. Keep your mobiles off and try to focus. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, Anjan, for um, the introduction. And also, thank you very much, Anjan, for, and uh, the government of India for making uh, this, this course possible. It's an honor for me to begin this course. I'm very happy to be back here. Uh, to uh, teach with Anjan this, this course. And also thank you for the Jamamilia University to host this and, and also make this possible. So thank, thank you very much. So as Anjan said, we'll be uh, covering um, the uh, part of cosmology and the way uh, structures form, in particular the way we can uh, learn cosmology from the formation of the large scale structures of the universe. And in particular, we will learn how we can do this with this uh, very special technique, which is called weak gravitational lensing. So we will start in a series of lectures. Uh, and today, I will just start with the first lecture in cosmology, where I will give a very broad overview of cosmology, and in particular, of the basic principles, and also some of the observational tools, the principles of some of the observational tools we have available, and how does the weak gravitational lensing technique uh, fall into this, this, this context. And then in the following lectures, we'll develop this in a lot more detail in a more uh, theoretical and quantitative basis. So very broadly speaking, cosmology uh, is the study of the universe as a whole. Uh, and it's a field that has seen very rapid progress in the last few decades. And it's uh, now very impressive uh, how uh, cosmologists have now a, a quite precise picture of the history of the universe. So as you can see here, uh, illustrated in this uh, artist diagram, we basically, uh, our, our cosmological model is based on uh, uh, the Big Bang paradigm, which is very simple. The idea is that at very early time, the universe was very hot and dense. And as the time evolved, the universe cooled down and expanded. And as a result of this cooling down and expansion, there was a number of phases or phase transitions that happened in the universe leading to the universe that we know today, simply through this cooling down process and, expan and, and expansion process. There are many steps uh, here. I will simply talk about a few. And then, of course, we'll come back to some of the uh, important ones later on. But following a, a very uh, initial phase, a very rapid expansion that we call inflation, then later on, we entered what we called a particle physics era, where the universe was filled up with, with particles. And eventually, the universe cooled down enough to form nuclei. Um, and a little bit later, uh, quite a bit later, uh, the universe cooled down even further. And then um, nuclei and electrons could combine together and form atoms. 
And then later on, the universe cooled down uh, even further. And then what happened is that the uh, perturbations present in the early universe, so the small perturbations um, in the universe, could grow into the structures that we see today. And structures such as galaxies, clusters of galaxies, stars, and so on could start forming. And eventually, uh, we come today, about 14 billion years later, uh, and see and can observe this, this universe. Okay. Now, all of these stages are now quite well understood. Uh, and as I said, we'll come back through some of these important steps uh, at different stages in the course. But before we do this, let's look at what the universe looks like today. So let's look at what the universe in particular is composed of. Well, first of all, of course, it's composed of what we call ordinary matter. In cosmology, we call this mostly baryons, which is kind of a misnomer. Uh, but that's, that's what the terminology we use in, in cosmology. And the ordinary matter is basically, simply speaking, is the, is the matter which is described by the standard model of particle physics. Um, and it can be studied in, laborat in the laboratory on Earth. It's also the matter, at least a fraction of this matter, is a matter that we see through with our telescopes. So here is a, a, a picture called the Hubble Deep Field, which was at the time one, with still one of the deepest images done with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you see, just looking at a very small piece of the sky a couple of arc minutes across, we see a very large number of galaxies, very, very distant galaxies of different colors and shapes. And the light that we see comes mainly from stars inside these galaxies. There are other, other processes, like active galactic nuclei and others, that produce the light. But basically, all of this, uh, uh, the, this image is made possible by photons emitted by ordinary matter um, and traveling all the way to us. So this is a matter that we understand, that we're used to, that we can study on Earth. Now, the problem is that when we look at the fraction of the energy density um, in the universe uh, composed of this ordinary matter. So if you take the full energy density of the universe today and say this is 100%, will be all the way up here, the amount of ordinary matter, um, uh, the fraction of this total energy density composed of ordinary matter is very small. It's typically of order 5% or so. So while, this, while in physics uh, we've been mostly focusing on this on this kind of, of matter, actually, it represents only a small fraction of the total energy density of the universe. So then the question is, what is the rest of the universe made up of? Well, there are different components. And the first one is dark matter, which is a form of matter which, uh, by construction, is dark. So we cannot see it directly. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, there's a quite a long history uh, of dark matter. Uh, it was initially uh, postulated by uh, Zwicky um, in the 30s. He didn't call it dark matter, he called it, he called it missing mass or other, other terms. Uh, but basically, Zwicky noticed that in order to, uh, he was looking at the structures like clusters of galaxies, which you, you saw here, we'll come back to it later. These are the largest bound structures in the universe. These are large structures made up of, composed of, uh, of galaxies, typically a thousand galaxies or so. And if he looked at, he studied the dynamics of these galaxies, how these galaxies move inside the cluster. And uh, looking at uh, the, the random motions, he could infer the uh, poten gravitational potential in which these galaxies had to sit in in order to have these kind of uh, dynamics, this kind of velocities. And he noticed that um, the, there's, a, there's a need for a large amount of mass, which is unseen in order to explain this these, uh, the dynamics of these galaxies. So you had to say there is much more mass than we can account for by looking only at the uh, visible matter emitted by the galaxies. All right. Then there was a, there's a long history, and there's now a large amount of evidence in astrophysics, astrophysical evidence for the presence of dark matter. We basically need to invoke this additional uh, matter, this uh, unseen matter. Um, in, uh, on basically all cosmological scales, going from galaxies to clusters of galaxies and even at cosmological, at the largest cosmological scale. Uh, by construction, the dark matter does not emit light because otherwise we would, we would see it. And the only evidence we have about dark matter is through its gravitational effect. So we see it through gravity. Gra the source of gravity is any form of energy or, or mass in this case. Uh, and therefore, it affects the, um, the trajectories of 
uh, objects orbiting in its vicinity. And as we'll see later, it also affects the trajectory of photons. And this is the basis of the uh, gravitational lensing effect that we'll be focusing on later on. Um, we know some of its properties from uh, cosmological observations. We know that it has to be very weakly interacting, either with ordinary matter or with itself. Otherwise, if it interacted more strongly with ordinary matter, we would see it eventually, uh, we will see eventually a decay into photons that we, and, and we know that we have upper limits about this. We also know that it cannot interact very strongly uh, with itself, otherwise it will change the properties of the distribution of the dark matter uh, that, we can, uh, that we can observe through uh, gravitational lensing effect or, or, or other effects as well. Uh, we know that it has to be cold, or another way, another way to say this has to be non-relativistic. Again, uh, if that were not the case, it would change the kind of structure that we observe today. And we, we know that the structures that we see are compatible with um, these non-relativistic or so-called cold dark matter. We also know that it cannot be made of ordinary matter. You could say maybe part of the ordinary matter is dark and we cannot see it. And indeed, that's true. We can only observe directly with our telescope the fraction of the ordinary matter. Uh, but the fraction that we don't observe falls short uh, from explaining the entire uh, mass density we need in dark matter. So it's, it's so-called non-baryonic. So it's not made up of ordinary matter. We also know that this distribution is relatively smooth. And there are very strong constraints on the granularity of the dark matter. So we know the dark matter is not made up of macroscopic objects uh, of the size of stars or, or planets or, or, or so on. So it's very likely to be a very smooth, uh, most probably a microscopic component. Uh, and therefore, there's a number of candidates for um, the nature of dark matter. And the favorite candidate is basically to think of, the, of dark matter as an unknown particle which is not part of the standard model of particle physics, so it's not part of ordinary matter. Um, and therefore, um, there are searches for these unknown particles beyond the standard model of particle physics. And there's a very large amount of work now being done into trying to detect or produce particles that uh, basically form the, the dark matter. Now, if we look at the amount of dark matter in the universe, and again, throughout the course, we'll show you how we can um, determine these, these fractions, then we see that, indeed, the amount of dark matter is much higher than the amount of ordinary matter. It's about 27% of the current energy density of the universe. Uh, however, it still falls short from, from explaining the entire energy density of the universe. By the way, I think we're keeping this interactive. So if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask. You mentioned any. about the dark matter particles. Mm -hmm. They must decay into standard water particles to be able to detect. Yes. Well, they must. We, this is very likely to be the case. Yes. So there are searches for what we call indirect searches of, for dark matter, which um, are basically search. Eventually, it, it probably will turn into photons, most likely high energy photons. So there are searches for photons arising from uh, annihilation of dark matter with itself or with ordinary, ordinary matter. And for the moment, there's some very interesting improvements uh, in these limits. Uh, for the moment, there's no clear evidence for uh, having found this decay. Uh, but the searches are, are ongoing, ongoing, especially with gamma ray telescopes. And there's even new experiments are being designed in order to, to do this. Yeah. So there are basically several ways of looking for this dark matter. Either we can look at it from the astrophysics, from astrophysical observations through its gravitational interaction, which is what we'll be uh, talking about here. You can also look for them in an indirect, through indirect detection by looking at decays of dark matter or interaction of dark matter with ordinary matter. It's, in, it's known to be very weak, but it may not be completely, uh, it may not vanish completely. And then we would see this indirect, uh, this uh, photons coming from this interaction. That's called indirect uh, dark matter search. There's also direct detection, so people try to um, detect interaction of dark matter with ordinary matter by uh, putting very large amounts of material and wait for a dark matter particle to interact with, um, with an ordinary, with a, with a nucleus in particular. And there's also accelerator-based searches where there um, uh, particle physicists try to generate, to produce by uh, going to very high energies to produce dark matter particles which eventually decay into something that we can see. So there's these four uh, methods for uh, studying and detecting dark matter, and each of them 
are a very, very active field of research. So that's a, so that's a good question. Yeah. Regarding the granular size of dark matter, there was a very recent paper which uh, said that primordial black holes. Yes. Dark, uh, yeah, considering primordial black holes uh, to be constituted of dark matter itself. That's right. So there's still a very narrow uh, parameter space of microscopic object that could make up dark matter, especially on the high end. And following the detection of gravitational waves, the report of detection of gravitational waves by LIGO, there was a, a report saying that perhaps what they've seen is um, dark matter in the form of black holes of about 100 solar masses or so. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit later. So most of these uh, limits on granularity, uh, or what I call granularity, come from this microlensing technique, which try to detect uh, gravitational lensing effect, gravitational uh, effect coming from uh, macroscopic objects in our galaxy. Uh, and indeed, it rules out uh, some uh, masses of a possible macroscopic object that could make up dark matter, but not, comp not, not all of them completely. Okay? But it, it's relatively narrow, so it's an interesting paper, certainly worth uh, looking at, especially the LIGO results are particularly interesting, and the mass of these black holes are sort of puzzling. Um, but the parameter space is quite small. So people have been focusing until, until recently on uh, microscopic um, uh, the, um, on microscopic models, or, or models where the, um, the uh, dark matter is microscopic in the form of particles. But that's true. That's right. That's what I was a little bit careful when I stated this statement. Um, but that's the, at least more the, our standard model currently uh, is through uh, standard, is uh, through uh, particle explanations for dark matter with weakly interacting particles. Any other question? So that's dark matter, okay? So climbing up, we're, we're getting there. We now have about 30% of the uh, energy density of the universe today that we, well, I wouldn't say that we understand, but at least uh, of which we know the different uh, ingredients. Uh, and then the, the, what is the rest of the uh, energy density made up of? Well, this is uh, something even more mysterious, mysterious called dark energy. Okay, so what is this dark energy? And Anjan works a lot on dark energy. You can ask him even more details about this from a theoretical point of view. Uh, so dark energy is something we don't understand at all. Uh, but it's, an, uh, it's a term or a word we give to a phenomenon that we see in the observations uh, and that we don't understand, and for which we have a number of possible uh, explanations. But, but it's very puzzling. So basically what we see uh, through the observation, and I'll come to the observations in a minute, how we, how we know all of this. Um, uh, what we see, one of the things we see in the observations is that as if we uh, look at the expansion of the universe as a function of time. So this is a simple diagram that shows time on the x-axis and sort of the relative size of the universe. So basically the expansion history of the universe. Uh, what we see is that uh, we see that the universe has recently starting to accelerate. The expansion of the universe has recently started to accelerate. Okay? And that cannot be explained if we fill the universe with uh, matter or even dark matter. So it's any kind of form of matter or even radiation, even relativistic uh, particles. Uh, if we fill the universe with any of these kind of matter, ordinary matter, or nothing exotic, then uh, the universe would, uh, depending on the amount of uh, uh, of matter would uh, expand, would expand and slow down, would expand, could even uh, recollapse, but would not be accelerating like this. So there's another, uh, there's something else uh, in the universe which uh, um, produces uh, an acceleration of the expansion, which is sort of started at our uh, cosmological epoch. Okay, so it's, it's very puzzling. Now, what can, what can it be? Well, there are many, many possibilities. But one way to think about it is to think of it as an effective fluid that we add to the, into the universe. Okay, so it's kind of a phenomenological description of this dark energy. And this fluid can be given uh, um, basically a, a, an equation of state. And uh, we can parameterize phenomenologically this, uh, this uh, equation of state with a parameter that we call W, which is called the equation of state parameter, which is the, the ratio of the pressure to the density of dark energy. And it turns out that to produce this acceleration, we need this ratio to be negative. There are other conditions as well. So it means uh, another way to say this is that we basically need a negative, uh, a sort of an effective fluid uh, 
or something that behaves like an effective fluid with negative pressure, uh, which is a really a, quite a strange kind of fluid indeed. Another way to say this is we need basically uh, some kind of repulsive gravitational effect, which is very puzzling uh, also because we know that at least in our standard view of gravity, uh, gravity is, is uh, only attractive. But here we need some kind of repulsive gravitational effect to produce this acceleration. Now, there are many models for uh, explaining dark energy. Again, Anjan can tell you uh, a lot of them. He's worked on many of them uh, and other people here. Uh, but one of the sort of the standard one that we, um, that we uh, invoke, at least for our standard model of cosmology, is the cosmologic constant that we, uh, symbol, uh, for which the symbol is capital lambda here, which would correspond to um, W, this equation of state parameter, equal to minus 1 at all times. So the in units of C equals to 1, the pressure and the density, uh, ratio of pressure, density of this effective fluid, at least phenomenologically, will be constant and equal to minus 1. Now, the history of the cosmological constant is quite interesting because it was initially uh, introduced by Einstein for uh, sort of the opposite reason. So in the early development of general relativity, soon after Einstein wrote down the equation of general relativity, um, he, uh, he and others solved for uh, the a solution for the whole universe. And what they found is they found solutions for where the universe was expanding. Now, of course, we now know the universe is expanding. By the time, they didn't know this. And in fact, there was a theoretical, uh, perhaps even philosophical prejudice that the universe had to be static. Um, and, and they found an expanding universe uh, a way to exotic uh, a possibility for the universe. So Einstein uh, added this cosmological constant in his equations of general relativity to make the universe static. And later on, when the, um, uh, the expansion of the universe was discovered observationally by Hubble, Lemaitre, and, and others, uh, then it was established that the universe was indeed expanding. And at least the story says that Einstein uh, realized it was his biggest mistake or biggest blunder. It's not clear, actually, if he actually said it. Uh, but uh, it's at least what the, the story we tell. Now, paradoxically, actually, his, perhaps his, what he called his biggest blunder happens to be correct. And indeed, we indeed need a cosmologic constant-like term uh, in uh, the equation or something that behaves like it or closely uh, like it uh, with an opposite sign here because we're not trying to make the universe static, but the other way we try to make it uh, expand, to, uh, to accelerate the expansion. But nevertheless, uh, one explanation for dark energy would be uh, an Einstein cosmic constant uh, with an opposite sign that Einstein uh, invoked. Uh, and this would, as I said, correspond to this uh, equation of state parameter equal minus one. There are many other models uh, based on dynamic uh, scalar fields and others uh, which are also being explored. And these would have, in more, ge more generally, an equation of state parameter, an effective uh, uh, equation of state parameter that would not be equal to minus one or not exactly equal to minus one and would generically at least vary as a function of time, of cosmological time. So one of the um, uh, uh, searches right now is to try to determine this, to measure this parameter W as a function of time to check that indeed dark energy behaves exactly like a cosmological constant or whether it uh, behaves like the, some of these, uh, the predictions from some of these <coughs> other models. Now, the problem with dark energy is that it's very difficult to reconcile with the understanding of the vacuum, in particular with the quantum mechanics of the vacuum. We know that the vacuum, uh, the, if we, if we uh, look at the quantum mechanics, the physics, the quantum mechanics uh, of, the, of the vacuum, we know that basically there's an energy density coming from quantum fluctuations <laughs> that indeed uh, gives it a non-negative uh, density. However, the scale of this energy, of the energy density uh, of this uh, known uh, quantum um, vacuum is at least 30 orders of magnitude larger than what we observe today. So it's off by at least 30 orders of magnitude. And that's why uh, physicists think that there's a mechanism to suppress this uh, vacuum energy density or this vacuum energy uh, to zero, and it's very difficult to understand how uh, this, uh, this uh, very large energy could be suppressed, but uh, to, not to zero, but to a value 30 orders of magnitude below, 
uh, which is very close to, uh, to the scale of the dark energy, uh, energy density that we see today, and which also uh, the same order of magnitude as the uh, energy density of dark matter, which has nothing to do, as far as, we can, as, as far as we think, with the quantum mechanics of the vacuum. So while dark matter is a phenomenon that we don't understand, but for which we have many uh, possible explanation from extensions of the standard model of particle physics. Here, dark energy is very puzzling because it's very hard to reconcile with some of the fundamental pillars of, um, of, uh, of, of, of microscopic physics. So uh, dark energy is uh, indeed a very great puzzle. Now underlying to all this uh, is the nature of gravity. So in, in, in the, one of the fundamental ingredients in, our, uh, in, in cosmology, in the physics of the, of the universe, is gravity, which is a driving force, the main interaction for, um, for, the, for the universe. And in fact, uh, when we look at gravity, our, general, our, our theory of gravity is called uh, general relativity. Uh, and, and one of the possibilities is that some of these phenomena, either dark energy or dark matter, are related to the fact that we need to modify Einstein's theory of general relativity, at least on cosmological scales. And there's also a, a large uh, amount of work being done on the theoretical side to see how we, whether we could modify Einstein's theory of general relativity to uh, explain one or two or, or several of these, uh, of these dark ingredients that we need to uh, invoke in order to explain the observations. So possibly, uh, it's our under, a fundamental understanding of gravity that needs to be revised. Another uh, very interesting uh, aspect of the model that is also being explored is the problem of the initial conditions. What, what, were the, what, set, what is the physics that set up the initial conditions in the universe? And in particular, what is the origin of the perturbations that grew on, to form the structures that we see today? And our, in our standard model, uh, that uh, the, the, the paradigm is called inflation, um, and that also has a number of open questions that, we, uh, that is still being worked on. So together, you see that, if we, if we look at this more globally, we see that uh, we've came up with a very precise picture of the universe, but we had to add a number of ingredients in our model to explain the observations, uh, and that uh, raised a number, uh, that leaves open a number of very pressing and fundamental questions in physics to explain these phenomena such as dark matter, dark energy, possible modifications of gravity on very large scales, and also the theory in, in, of inflation for initial conditions. Any questions about this? Again, we'll come back to these more quantitatively uh, later on in the course. Now, how do we know all this? Okay, so I give you the sort of the bottom line of what the universe is made up and the main ingredients in our uh, current cosmological model. But how do we know all of this? Well, there's basically two handles that we have, two um, uh, physical handles that we have to study the, the universe and to constrain our cosmological model. Uh, and one of them is what we call geometrical uh, 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 handles, and another one is, is, is those based on the growth of structure. So let's talk about each of them at least quanti qualitatively. So one th first thing we can do is we can try to probe the uh, geometry of the universe, or more, or more, another way to say it, we can probe the uh, global expansion history of the universe by looking at what we call geometrical probes. So an example of this is to consider an observer here, and let's consider the observer looks at a standard stick, which is some distance away, cosmological distance away from the observer. Now the universe is expanding, so the stick, uh, let's suppose the stick is, has a fixed size in physical coordinates, so it's his, it has a fixed physical size, and let's suppose that it expands with the universe. Now as the universe uh, 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 expands, um, the uh, stick will become larger and larger, so as we observe the stick, uh, if we could observe the stick at different uh, distances, which in cosmology correspond to different times, because time take, light takes time to travel from, from us to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the source, then the stick would grow. And then we, we, what we could do in simple terms, we could say, let's suppose we can measure the, uh, angular, the apparent angular size of this object. All right? So let's say it's here. It has this 
physical size, it would subtend this angle here. And as it becomes uh, closer and closer, so the universe has, a, the, as a result, we're seeing it at later times, so the stick has expanded. With the expansion of the universe, then it would subtend a different angle. All right. Then what we could do is we could measure the relationship between the apparent size of the object and its distance, and that would give us a measure of the expansion of the universe. Okay? And that is, the, that is called uh, a standard ruler. Okay? So if we could find a standard ruler, uh, which we know has a fixed size and expands with the universe, then uh, we could measure the apparent size of, the, of this uh, standard ruler as a function of, this, of its distance, and we can probe the uh, expansion history of the universe. We can also do it not with a standard ruler, but we'll see later, we can do it with a standard, so-called standard candle, which is a source of a fix of a known uh, luminosity. Uh, and as a function of distance, it would have a different apparent flux, which would again depend on the distance, which would allow us to probe the expansion of the universe. All right, so these, uh, these uh, way of measuring are, pu are purely uh, probing the global geometry of the universe and the global expansion. Another handle that we have is based on the growth of structures, okay? So this probes the way density perturbations grow as a function of time. And as a result, uh, it, also, it, it probes the, um, the formation of the structure that we see today. Now, what the, now, it turns out that the growth of structure is a, is a competition between two effects. So if you think about two blobs here, uh, denoted by these blue uh, spheres, then basically we have two effects. On the one hand, gravity tries to pull these two blobs together. So it, tries to, um, it attracts the two blobs, so it tries to make structures grow. On the other hand, the expansion of the universe tries to pull them apart. So the way the, the growth of structures in the universe is basically a competition between gravity and the expansion of the universe. Um, and therefore, by studying the way the structures grow as a function of time, we can again probe, and, and we assume we know gravity, so we assume we know gravity is, 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 uh, is uh, the physics of gravity is, is given by general relativity, then once again we can probe the expansion of the universe. So this is another way of studying uh, these dark ingredients, or our cosmological model, by studying not only the global expansion, but also the way uh, perturbations grow in the, in the universe. And again, we'll be coming back to that uh, later on in the course. Now, more precisely, how can we make these measurements? Well, to do this, we rely on what we call cosmological probes. So there are different uh, ways where we, that we can, where we can measure uh, these, there are different ways where we can measure both the geometry, the growth of structure, or a combination of these two uh, effects. Uh, and what we do is we measure this in different ways. Uh, through different, uh, different probes, and then we combine these probes together to constrain our model. And the reason we do this is for, different, for, is for various reasons. First of all, it helps to get uh, better constraints on our model because we can combine different measurements, okay? <coughs> and also, uh, it also helps to overcome um, a, a difficulty in cosmology, which is the fact that cosmology is an observational science as opposed to an experimental science. By this, I mean that in cosmology, we rely on observations, but we cannot go and modify the system to simplify it and to isolate a phenomenon. We, uh, we, we can only rely on observation, which means that the phenomena are complex and need to be disentangled. It's not like a physics experiment where we can design the experiment to uh, isolate a certain phenomena that we want to, uh, to, we want to measure. Here, we have to deal with all the phenomena together and find windows where we can make a precise uh, inference on the, on the system. But there's always a, a complicated uh, effects and astrophysical effect that we need to disentangle. So by combining these different cosmological probes, the advantage is that we have different uh, what we call systematic effects or different astrophysical uh, phenomena that we need to disentangle. And by combining them, we can get around that and get a, a, a more certain um, uh, measurement of the underlying uh, physics of in our in our model. So basically, there are different different classes of cosmological probes, uh, and I'll be talking about each of them uh, one by one very briefly now. Uh, 
And of course, uh, the main, one of the main focus of the course is this, this uh, gravitational lensing probe, which, is a special, uh, which has a special place in cosmology, as I'll uh, soon explain. <laughs> At a very important uh, phase transition in the universe, which is when the, the, uh, the first atoms formed, so when nuclei and electrons combine to forming atoms. And this has a very important consequence uh, for the universe, is that the universe suddenly became neutral. And as a result, uh, uh, photons uh, 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 suddenly could travel freely into the universe. Another way to say this is that the universe suddenly, or, short, or very soon, uh, became uh, transparent to photons. So suddenly the universe became transparent. And uh, this happened at energy scales or temperatures about corresponding to one electron volt or so. Uh, and so, uh, and the idea is that before this, the uh, electrons and photons, uh, the electrons and photons or the baryons and photons were tightly coupled due to very strong interactions between the ionized plasma and the photons. And as uh, the atoms could uh, formed, then photons uh, suddenly had a very small interaction, cross-section with the, uh, the uh, baryons and, and the, the, the photons could travel freely. So it means that we can see uh, photons uh, up to this uh, last interaction that they had with the, uh, the baryons, and that is called the last scattering surface. And we can now measure this very precisely. So this is a, pic this is a picture of the cosmic microwave background or a measurement of the cosmic microwave background done uh, by the Planck collaboration. The Planck uh, is, a, is a satellite that was recently uh, launched and, uh, and uh, for which a very high precision measurement were made. And what you see is a picture of this last scattering surface. What is plotted here is the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. The mean temperature is around 3 uh, Kelvin. Uh, but there are very small fluctuations that you see here, which corresponds to a fluctuation in temp of temperature in about one part in 10 to the 4 or so. Alex, yep. Uh, is there sure. So there's a statistical effect. Mm -hmm. You just take a patch of space. Yes. The number of photons and the temperature. Yes. How do you achieve this accuracy? Well, that's very difficult. <laughs> very difficult. With great difficulty, that's the answer. <laughs> Uh, but basically, what they have to do is that's why they go to space. They also have measurements from the ground. But basically, you have to cool down your apparatus to very low temperatures. And there are different technologies to measure. So this is done in the microwave, all right? And what they do is they have uh, detectors with different technologies. With Planck, it's uh, basically bolometer technologies that allows them to measure the uh, flux, basically, of the photons from which they can uh, infer the, the temperature, OK? So they, what they do is they measure the flux of the photons uh, in different patches of the sky uh, by scanning the sky. They do it in different frequencies, uh, which allows them to get um, um, a temperature measurement because the cosmic microwave background follows very closely a Planck black body spectrum. In fact, it's uh, remarkably close to a black body uh, spectrum. They use also the multi-frequencies to disentangle other astrophysical effects. There's quite a lot of work in uh, in particular, removing the foregrounds from our own galaxy, which also emit in the microwave region. Uh, and then uh, from that, they can get a map like this of the temperature. Okay? But it's a, it's a very, um, very high-tech, uh, low-temperature uh, bolometer technologies, so basically. You're reaching fourth decimal Yes. Absolute. Yeah, micro-Kelvin kind of. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. It's, it's extremely <laughs> impressive measurements. From the, from the experimental point of view. There's also a big effort to do it from the ground, and there's an ongoing measurements now, especially in the South Pole and also in Chile, for measuring this and advanced, more advanced statistical that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and that's an ongoing, um, ongoing research uh, frontier right now. So my, my question was that, like in, in gravitational wave detectors, we recycle the photons and mm -hmm. all to increase sensitivity. Right. I never understood how they do that. Yeah, well, it's yeah. I mean, it's um, yeah. It's very, it's very, yeah, it's 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 very impressive. Uh, and one thing that helps us also is that it, what we need to do is differential measurements from one place to the other, right? We we we'll, we measure the absolute um, uh, temperature in different ways as well. Okay, so we get a map like this of the temperature fluctuations, 
Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, so this basically gives us a picture of the universe at early times. Basically, the state, at least the, the state of the structures in the universe at early times, it shows that the universe was very much homogeneous, um, but there were very small perturbations of the order of 10 to minus 4 uh, at, at, the, uh, at the time that are now mapped by these measurements. Now, what we can do with this is uh, take this map and then measure the statistical properties of these perturbations. And that's extremely rich in uh, information. So we can, uh, what is done is we can take a Fourier transform. Uh, so this is on the sphere. So we can take a spherical Fourier transform of this map and measure what is called the, uh, the spherical harmonic power spectrum of these fluctuations. And what is shown here is one of the latest measurements by the Planck uh, surveyor team. And what is shown here is the um, so-called multiple moments, so it's kind of the Fourier mode. Uh, on the x-axis and the y-axis is the amplitude of the perturbation on these scales. So this corresponds to inverse angular scales, so this corresponds to large scales on the, on the sky, this corresponds to small scales. And here it shows the amount of fluctuations or, per, or, or deviations from uh, constant temperature as a function of, of, of this scale. Okay, so this corresponds to large scale fluctuation, this corresponds to small scale fluctuation. <coughs> scale in a, in a convenient way. <coughs> and you, you see now the quality of the measurements. So the, you see the, uh, the blue points with error bars. Forget the red line for a second. You notice that they're extremely good measurement now. You can barely see the error bars on this plot. Extremely impressive. We also see that there's a number of features which are extremely well uh, measured and resolved by these measurements. And you see that uh, there's a quite a wide range of scales and with these so-called uh, oscillations or wiggles that we see in the power spectrum. You also see that on large scales here, the errors are larger. And that's coming from a phenomenon called cosmic variance, which is the fact that since we only have one sky, we only have a few um, uh, large scale modes, Fourier modes uh, or spherical harmonic modes that we can measure. So the errors increase uh, on large scales due to the fact we only have one sky. Uh, and, and if you plotted this on, on uh, to a smaller scale, you will see also the error bars increase. You can sort of see it in the residual here. Uh, on small scales, that's because on small scales we can start uh, we start uh, having we can start seeing the effect of the finite uh, uh, sensitivity and resolution of the experiment. Eventually, uh, the errors increase because of this. Okay. And these wiggles are very important. They basically uh, arise from uh, plasma physics, basically. So they come from acoustic oscillations, sound waves in the photon baryon fluid at the time of last scattering. Uh, and they provide a lot of cosmological information that depend on the amount of, um, of, of uh, dark matter. They, they depend on the total density of the universe. They depend on the uh, amount of uh, uh, baryons, ordinary matter, and so on and so on. And what you see here in this red line is a fit to this data point uh, in our, with our standard cosmological model that we call lambda CDM. I'll come back to that a bit later. With six parameters, and you see the excellent fit between the data and the model. And that's the residual in the fit. And that's where we get a, a lot of our uh, cosmological information, as I said. Now, in the cosmic microwave background, one can measure more than the temperature. That's even more difficult. <laughs> and in fact, it's still uh, sort of the uh, very, very large effort is being done here. We can measure not only the temperature fluctuations, but we can also measure the polarization of the photons. So it turns out that the uh, microwave background is also uh, polarized. Uh, and that's symbolized by these lines here that, sh that describe sort of the, pol the polarization direction of the photons, uh, and, and there are patterns in this polarization, just like there are patterns in the temperature fluctuations. Okay? And uh, very interestingly, uh, one can decompose these uh, polarization patterns into different so-called modes, uh, which are shown here. They're called uh, E modes and B modes, uh, following um, an analogy with electricity and magnetism. So basically, you can take any polarization field like this, which you think is, a, is basically an arrowless vector at every point on a, on a sphere here, or it could, you can do it on the plane as well. So this corresponds to um, a, a special uh, spin-to-field, which basically 
doesn't, so it's like a vector, but doesn't have an arrow, so it goes back to itself if you rotate by 180 degrees. And you can show that any such uh, field uh, can be decomposed into two components. One is the electric-like uh, modes, and one is the magnetic-like modes. So the electric modes have no uh, handedness, so they're the same if you look at them in the mirror, uh, while the B modes have a handedness, so they, uh, the patterns uh, flip if you look at them in the mirror. And you can, in a unique way, uh, at least in the absence of noise and finite resolution and so on, uh, you can uniquely decompose these patterns into E and B modes uh, and measure, therefore, uh, not one power spectrum, but several power spectrum. And that's what the, this is the measurement from the Planck team. You see the measurement of the um, E modes uh, uh, here and some of the cross correlation. So this is the E mode power spectrum. This is the uh, cross power spectrum, spectrum between the temperature and the E modes. Uh, and you see again now very clear measurements of these uh, polarization power spectra and cross power spectra, again with small error bars and very good fit uh, to our cosmological model. And together, these can be combined to give us a very tight constraint on our uh, cosmological, uh, cosmological model. And you, uh, if you look at the Planck papers, you get a table like this. So the point is not to uh, read all these numbers. That's obviously uh, too small. You probably can't even see them. Uh, but the idea is just to show the, the sort of size of the, uh, of the precision of the measurement. So these are the uh, six parameters of this standard model of cosmology, which we call lambda CDM, which is basically general relativity plus called dark matter plus ordinary matter described by the standard model of particle physics plus a cosmological constant, and plus uh, an inflationary phase to provide the initial conditions. And these are the constraints that the, the team gets on this, the six parameter of this, uh, of this model. Uh, the different columns correspond to the amount of information they use, uh, in, with increasing amount of information being used here, especially adding polarization, or adding some of the other cosmological probes that I'll be describing next. And if you just look at the, uh, the, the size of these errors, so you see that we get percent or sub-percent precision on these, uh, on these parameters. So extremely, impressive, uh, extremely impressive measurements. Now, if we expand the model and start looking at the precision one gets on the dark energy parameters, so here this is assuming that the uh, dark energy is made up of, uh, is, consists of the cosmic constant, which, remember, correspond to an equation of state for the dark energy effective fluid equals to minus 1 at all times. Well, you can start making a Taylor expansion of this uh, equation of state parameter, W, and think that you can look at its value today, and it's a derivative as a function of time. So you can, you can characterize the evolution, the, the, uh, the value of the uh, equation of state parameter for dark energy in its, in its equation and its evolution with two parameters and start constraining the, uh, this parameter. Um, uh, so this is basically an expansion of the standard model, this lambda CDM model, in which the dark energy is no longer an uh, um, uh, a cosmology constant, but something more complicated with an evolving equation of state. And you can start constraining it. And basically, uh, what we see, so this is W, and this is the derivative of W. So if it's a cosmological constant, W should be equal to minus 1 at all times. So it should be here. That's minus 1 for W. And uh, all time means the derivative is 0. So that corresponds to the uh, intersection of these two lines. So it corresponds to this point. And if you combine uh, various uh, cosmological probes uh, with the CMB, you get con typically constrained like this. It depends exactly what you combine with what. Uh, but some of the typical current constraints uh, correspond to these contours, where you see that the contours uh, are, so this correspond to different confidence levels, uh, and these contours are consistent with the cosmological constant, but still with the relatively large error bars as to its value, typically 5 to 10 percent, and with typically 10 to 20 percent error on the equation of state uh, parameter here. So it's consistent with the cosmological constant, but there's still room for uh, the possibility that uh, other models of dark energy is uh, is valid. Uh, you mentioned yeah. the assumption of inflationary also good. Yes. The power sensitive are these numbers to work, and what you do is that. Yeah. So what you assume really is that uh, you you have to assume that uh, well, what you really assume is that you have a um, you know the properties of the fluctuations 
before the surface of last scattering. So in other words, you, 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 have, you say that you know the property of the fluctuations at early times. And here, it is assumed that you think that the perturbations have a power spectrum, which is a, which is a, a simple power law with an unknown amplitude and a slope. And for instance, uh, two of these parameters uh, characterize this amplitude and this slope. So this is the amplitude of the power spectrum, and this is the slope, all right? And inflation generically, uh, well, st standard, uh, st standard implementation of inflation generically uh, predict to a good approximation a power law with a slope close to one with a small deviation. And that's indeed what we see. Basically, the slope here is very close to one, and the amplitude is given by this. So strictly speaking, you, what you need is uh, for, purely for the CMB, uh, all you need is to have a special kind of fluctuation called adiabatic fluctuations in this, in this model. So special kind of uh, ratio between the fluctuation different components with this power law regime, and then you can constrain the power law. And these come out naturally from the inflation models. Now, the inflation models also produce the, uh, also predict relation between these fluctuations and the polarization fluctuation, which arise from actual gravitational waves in the early universe. And so by looking for these uh, polarization uh, modes, you can also constrain inflation even further. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, strong gravitational events have an effect on CMB, isotropy of CMB. What do you mean by strong gravitational events? One that is producing uh, highly intense gravitational waves, like collapsing black holes. Collapsing black holes, uh, it depends. Well, that, you, it depends on the kind of models that you, that you consider. But the, 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 um, and it depends how many you have. But the ones that, um, that, that can be observed with gravitational wave detectors uh, would have a relatively small effect here. What is there is that also gravitational waves produce in the very early universe, which produce a gravitational wave background, and that uh, has an effect. And in fact, it's one of the things that are being searched for uh, uh, through the polarization measurements. Yeah. They're basically, we're looking at different uh, frequency modes that are relevant for this. OK. So that's a cosmic microwave background, which, as I said, gives us uh, is sort of the driver right now for cosmological information. Uh, but in order to learn more uh, about the universe, and in particular, in order to constrain uh, dark energy better, one needs to probe the universe um, at late time, so close to a cosmological epoch, which is when dark energy uh, is important. As I told you, dark energy is a word for the uh, accelerated expansion at late times, at our epoch while the cosmic microwave background, for the most part, uh, probes uh, stages of the universe which are earlier than this. It's also sensitive in other ways, but uh, the primary informations come from early times. So what we need is to have more information at late times or in a more local <coughs> universe. And this is done by studying a large-scale structure in the more local universe. And one of the ways of doing it is through uh, galaxy surveys. So what, how much time do you have? About 10 minutes or so? Another, another 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Good. Very good. So um, the way to do this is look at galaxy surveys, which probe the more local universe. And uh, this is a, a picture of one of the uh, surveys. There are now two. Uh, there has been two main surveys that have uh, given us a, a very accurate map. One is called the SDSS, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and the 2DF surveys. And what you get is typically um, uh, pictures like this. So what is shown here in the different color scale is the density of galaxies <laughs> uh, as a function of position. So the red regions correspond to places where there's very large density of galaxies, and the blue ones correspond to places where there's uh, very low density of galaxies. And this is mapped, uh, this is mapped in three-dimensional and spherical geometry because these uh, galaxy surveys can give us three-dimensional information about the position of galaxies. Uh, by the measurement of not only the position of the galaxies in the sky, but also a uh, measure of its radial distance uh, using the redshift of the galaxies. Okay. So, um, so we get a distribution like this. So you see that the distribution of galaxies is not homogeneous. I mean, it's homogeneous when you smooth it on sufficiently large scales, like 100 megaparsec or so. Uh, but um, the, uh, the, when you look at smaller scales, there's a lot of inhomogeneities. You see there are denser regions, there are different bubbles, there's all sorts of filaments, also complicated 
uh, distribution. And one, what one can do is we can do an analysis similar to what was done with the cosmic microwave background. One can look at the statistical properties of the distribution of these galaxies, except this time it's in three dimensions, right? With a cosmic microwave background, it was a two-dimensional spherical map. Here it's a three-dimensional distribution. Um, but we can do uh, uh, an analysis which is sort of similar and we can look at what uh, we call the galaxy power spectrum. So this is a power spectrum of the uh, density of galaxies uh, in the universe. And this is a typical measurement. This is done with the, by the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey, a uh, survey called BOSS. And uh, what you get is measurement like this. So again, this is the uh, inverse uh, uh, scale here, except now it's no longer angular scale, it's physical scale. So this is basically the Fourier mode. You do a Fourier analysis and you look at the Fourier modes. So this corresponds to large scale, this corresponds to small scales. And here again is the amplitude of the fluctuations of the number of galaxies as a function of scale, all right? Uh, scale in a, in a convenient way. And one gets now this very good measurement for the um, power spectrum of galaxies. You see a smooth um, behavior, oops. What have I done here? You get a smooth uh, behavior here, but you also get these wiggles here in the power spectrum. Which, and if you remove the smooth part from the, um, you, 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 you um, subtract the smooth part and you look at the residual, you get these clear oscillations as well, okay? Now, when, now in the, for the galaxy power spectrum, there's a lot of information actually in the power spectrum and different uh, information one can extract. One, one thing one can do is look at the full shape of the power spectrum, okay? Uh, and uh, compare to a, a, a model for structure formation, just like we compared the CMB power spectrum with a, our cosmo the prediction for our cosmological model and infer cosmology from it. Now the difficulty with galaxies is that what we observe is not the density perturbations directly, which is what the model predicts. So the model will predict the, the, the fluctuation of mass, basically, or density fluctuations. But what we observe instead is the, the, the distribution of galaxies, which is not quite the same as the distribution of mass. We think galaxies trace the mass, but not exactly and in a slightly complicated way. And the way to uh, characterize or quantify the relationship between the mass and the, uh, dens uh, the density perturbations and the galaxies, or another way, to uh, quantify the relationship between mass and the visible matter that we observe through the galaxies. We introduced the notion of galaxy bias, which was introduced by uh, Nick Kaiser, and now has a, a lot of uh, work being done on it. So the idea, at least in simple terms, is that you can relate the power spectrum of galaxies, which depends on scale or Fourier mode, and redshift, because it, it evolves as a function of redshift, or it evolves as a function of time. Um, and you can relate it to the power spectrum of the density perturbations, which is what we can predict from theory. And Anjan will describe some of the physics of that. Uh, so, you, uh, so you take the, the galaxy power spectrum is equal to the density power spectrum, or we call it the matter power spectrum, times a quantity here which we call the bias, which can evolve with redshift, and could, at least on some scale, also depend on scale. Now, if we, look to, if we go to sufficiently, sufficiently large scales, we have reasons, good theoretical reasons to believe that, uh, the, that the bias only depends on redshift and not on scale, because we think that these scales are still in a linear regime, uh, and therefore uh, it's a good approximation to think of this bias as a function of uh, redshift, but not of k. Okay, so another way to say this, if we measure the galaxy power spectrum at a given redshift on these large scales, then we can get a measure of the uh, density power spectrum or the matter power spectrum up to a constant that we don't know. So we can't really use the amplitude, uh, but we can use the shape of the power spectrum, at least on large, on large scales. The amplitude, of course, gives us something interesting. It gives us something about information about the physics of the formation of galaxies. So astrophysically, it's very interesting, but for cosmology, we cannot use it directly. But nevertheless, uh, if we make these assumptions or if we model the bias carefully and so on, uh, uh, one can try and use the entire shape of the galaxy power spectrum. Now, uh, 
that's one thing we can do, and that's where you would get the most amount of information. Uh, but one can try to be more conservative uh, and use only some features of the galaxy power spectrum which are less sensitive or, or barely not sensitive to this, to this assumption about bias. And one of the very powerful way of doing this is by studying what is called these baryon acoustic oscillations, which are basically these wiggles, right? So it turns out that, and that's quite, quite remarkable, that these wiggles that you see here are basically the same physics as the wiggles you see you saw in the cosmic microwave background fluctuations. Uh, and they're basically coming from the same uh, acoustic oscillation, the same sound waves at the surface of last scattering. And now they're no longer, they're not imprinted, uh, well, we don't see it through the imprint on the um, fluctuations in the, in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, we see, we observe it through the, the imprint of these acoustic waves on the uh, galaxy power spectrum. And they've now, as I said, been measured quite well. And what one can, we can do a lot of things uh, with it, but the simplest thing one can do is we can just measure the uh, position of the first peak or one of the troughs of these, uh, of these wiggles. And we can relate it to the physics of these acoustic oscillations. It turns out that's relatively well-known physics, basically plasma physics. It's related to the sound wave of these uh, acoustic um, oscillations at the surface of last scattering. And we have good reasons to, be, to, to, to believe that uh, at least um, given the information the cosmic microwave background is giving us, that this, um, the scale of these first acoustic peaks is around 100 megaparsec or so, all right? And so that gives us basically a standard stick. So this, at least if we're in a linear regime, we have a, a scale for these oscillations that is fixed um, in co-moving coordinates, and then we can measure that at different redshift and get a measurement of the geometry. And what is interesting is that we can do it both in the um, transverse. So if we look at the line of sight, we can measure this both in the transverse direction, so in the direction of the plane of the, of the uh, surface of the sky. We can measure it basically in angular. Uh, we can measure the, the, the uh, uh, barren acoustic oscillation peaks in the angular direction. We can also measure it in the radial direction that gives us additional uh, information and, and the complementary information. And from this, we can measure, we can get a pure ge geometrical measure uh, ev uh, through this measurement of the power spectrum uh, wiggles like this. So even though we're using the um, uh, density perturbation, the growth of structure here, we've isolated a feature in it that gives us a pure geometrical measure, which is very powerful and much less sensitive uh, on, the, on the bias. Uh, another very interesting piece of information uh, is uh, called redshift space distortions. And this comes from the fact that when we look at the position of galaxies, the radial direction is very special compared to the transverse direction. So the transverse direction, we can directly measure the, for, to measure the transverse position of galaxies, we can just measure the position of galaxies on the sky. So that's relatively easy. But to measure the radial direction, we, cannot me we don't have a measure of distance directly. What we can measure is the redshift of the galaxies, uh, which is the, the redshifting effect coming from the expansion and which is larger and larger as the galaxies are further and further away. Uh, so that gives us a proxy of the distance, of the radial distance of the galaxy, but it's not exactly the radial distance of the galaxy. In particular, if the galaxies are also moving uh, with respect to the, Hubble, to, the, to the global expansion of the universe, so they're moving towards us or moving away from us just because they're um, in a cluster of galaxies orbiting or very other reasons, uh, that we call a peculiar velocity. So they have, if they have a velocity which is, uh, an which is in addition to the, to the global expansion, then this will also affect the redshift, so some kind of Doppler effect. So not only are we going to measure redshifting from the fact that they're moving away from us because the universe is expanding, but also if they're moving away from us or towards us, we're also going to see a, a Doppler effect, which could be a redshift or a blue shift. And that means that the power spectrum we measure in the tangential direction will be different from the one we measure from the radial direction because the radial direction will be affected by these peculiar velocity effects. So one can measure the two-dimensional power spectrum. In this case, it's done in a real space. So this is actually the two-dimensional correlation function, sort of Fourier transform analog of this, by looking at transverse direction and radial directions. 
And instead of, so if we didn't have these specular velocities, this would look like, would look uh, spherical. So it would be the same in all directions. So intrinsically, the universe has no special direction. So it's the same in all direction. But because of these peculiar velocities, we see these distortions along the radial directions, which are called these redshift space distortions. And in some sense, they are, pro they are a nuisance because they make it more complicated, but they also have a lot of very interesting information in them. In particular, we can measure the growth rate of um, the fluctuations using this effect. So you see that the, by looking at the, 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 the distribution of galaxies, uh, there's a very interesting, a lot of very interesting phenomena, and we can use different parts of this phenomena, different parts of the power spectrum to infer different kind of information. And one can do this and combine the results. So this is, for instance, a measurement with the BOSS survey, uh, which uh, a few years ago, which was at the time the largest uh, redshift survey used for this purpose. And uh, you can see the, this is a correlation function. So this is a Fourier transform of the power spectrum as a function of scale. So again, this is this time real uh, scale in megaparsec. This is the amplitude of the fluctuation. One of them is in the uh, tangential direction, and one of them is in the perpendicular direction. You see that they're different for various reasons, and you can fit this using a model of uh, our standard model and prediction for our standard model, and constrain uh, our cosmological model. In particular, we can constrain, uh, for instance, the amount of dark, uh, we can constrain the amount of dark matter here, or the amount of matter and the uh, equation of state for dark energy, which is here, uh, plotted here on the y-axis. You can combine these uh, measurements from BOSS uh, from the, in this paper, they combine the measurement from BOSS with cosmic microwave background measurements. With, uh, di with different combinations, you get stronger and stronger constraints. And again, you get something consistent with about 30% for the amount of uh, matter in the universe and an equation of state consistent with a cosmological constant minus one with an error of 10% or so at the time. Again, you can now assume that you, the, the dark energy has an um, evolving uh, equation of state, and then you can constrain uh, again this equation of state and its evolution, and again you get something consistent with a cosmological constant, which would be uh, here on this point at the intersection between these two lines, with some errors corresponding to about, in this case, quite quite large errors on, on W and, and W zero. <laughs> okay, so this is what we do if we analyze the position of, of galaxies, which is basically the distribution of visible matter, or, or tracer of visible matter through uh, the starlight emitted and other processes emitted by galaxies. Now what would be nice, as I show you, is if we could get rid of this, right? So if we could get rid of this bias and directly measure the, density, the property of the underlying density perturbations, uh, that would be much better because uh, we could then uh, more directly connect to our theoretical models and avoid uh, all the assumptions or uh, possible uh, issues having to do with this bias model. And that's what gravitational lensing basically afford. And that's what we'll spend a lot of time on in the course, uh, but that I'll introduce uh, shortly here. I think we have five more minutes. So gravitational lensing uh, effect is illustrated in this diagram. So you imagine you have an observer here on Earth, and you imagine that you observe a distant galaxy in the background. Now, if the galaxy in the back, if there's no uh, density perturbations along the line of sight between the galaxies and uh, the observer, then the light would travel in a straight line, and we would see the intrinsic shape of the galaxy. Nothing special. But if there's a density perturbation uh, around the line of sight, okay, let's say a cluster of galaxy, a galaxy, or, or anything, then the, uh, l the photons, as they travel from the galaxy to us, instead of traveling in, the, in a straight line, they will have a trajectory which is perturbed or curved. And this is a direct consequence of Einstein's theory of general relativity, which says that photons are also affected by the curvature of space-time, which are produced by density perturbations. And again, we'll go into a lot more detail about this later. Now the beauty of this is that when we can, we can use this effect, so, so instead of seeing, so as a, as a consequence, instead of seeing the galaxy, uh, the intrinsic shape and position of the galaxy, we see a distorted version of the galaxy. And the distortion of the image of the galaxy will depend on the density perturbations between the galaxy and us. 
And the beauty of this is that we can use this distortion, the apparent shape of the galaxies, the observed shape of the galaxies, to infer the mass distribution along the line of sight uh, of the lens. So this is called lensing. So this is called the lens. This is called the source. <coughs> and we can infer the mass distribution of the perturbation between us and the galaxies. So as a result, we can be directly sensitive to the mass fluctuations. Yeah. To um, infer that the uh, image of the galaxy is distorted, do we have uh, any true image of the galaxy? So, that we can so that's a very good question. We'll discuss that in, in great detail later on. But of course, we don't have the intrinsic shape of the galaxy. We don't know what it looks like in the absence of lensing. So there are different ways of uh, going around it. We can go into the very strong lensing regime where the distortion is so strong that basically the intrinsic shape of the galaxy doesn't matter very much. It's completely, uh, the observed shape is completely dominated by the bending effect of the light. Or we can go into the weak lensing effect where we can average a very, very large number of galaxies which are on average randomly oriented and look for coherent alignment of the galaxies coming from the lensing effect. We'll, we'll go into that into, into, great, into great detail. Um, so the, uh, the advantage of lensing is that we can directly probe the mass. Since the matter in the universe is dominated by dark matter, this means that we can basically uh, directly probe the distribution of dark matter. And we can compare this directly to structure uh, models, uh, our model of the universe and, and model of structure formation. And this is now done uh, with increasing and increasing precision. This is a map, a mass map done, uh, one of the uh, latest mass maps uh, done uh, with the uh, sort of one of the state of the art survey called the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, this was actually done by my postdoc in uh, ETH, uh, so we're very proud of this. Uh, this is done with the initial uh, data uh, of the survey. Again, we'll come back to this in, in great detail later. But what you see here, is uh, basically the projected, a map of the projected mass between us and distant galaxies. The red regions are over density, and the blue regions are under density, and the greens are intermediate. And you see that there are a lot of fluctuations coming from uh, perturbations, um, the density perturbations in the, in the universe. By the way, it was not only done by Herb, also by um, Vinu Vikram, which at the time was at UPenn. Uh, an Indian uh, postdoc uh, over there, so we're also proud of that too. Uh, so we can also take these maps, uh, and now there's no uh, a better maps being done now with uh, more data. We're currently working on this, and there are other surveys working on this as well. Uh, but we can take these maps and again do an analysis of this fluctuation, like we did for galaxies or the CMB. We can look at the power spectrum or the correlation function of these fluctuations and measure them. Uh, and you see the measurement here. So you see the uh, fluctuations in the mass as a function of uh, angular scale in this case. Uh, so, so sort of the uh, inverse uh, Fourier transform of the power spectrum of the CMB, uh, but this time for the mass fluctuations. The nice thing is that we can also do it for galaxies at different redshifts. So we can do this in sort of three dimension. We can get three dimensional information by doing for galaxies at different redshifts. We give us information about the structures at different redshifts, which give us a number of correlation functions. And then we can use them and combine, compare it to our prediction from our, for our cosmological model shown here. And again, get constraints on our cosmological model. In this case, this is a constraint on W and the y, in the y axis. And here is the, on the amplitude of the fluctuations from inflation as, measure, as, it's, as it's measured today. And again, by combining all the different measurements with Planck and so on, uh, we could get constraint. Uh, which are consistent with a cosmological constant again with an error about 10, 5, 10% or so. And here the advantage is that we don't have to make any assumptions about the relationship between visible matter and mass. We're directly measuring the mass fluctuations. And that's the great strength of lensing. Uh, and that's why we're focusing on this, uh, in this in this school. Now, the downside of this, of course, there's, nothing, there's no such thing as a free lunch, as people say. But uh, the, the, the disadvantage is that it's a much harder measurement, of course, because we have to measure very small uh, shape uh, correlations in galaxies. So these measurements are more difficult. It's much easier, and we get much higher signal to noise by measuring the density perturbations in the number of galaxies directly. Uh, but, the, but with the lensing, we don't have the difficulty of having to invoke a relationship between visible matter and visible matter and the mass and dark matter, basically. <coughs> 
So, um, and that's what, that's what I'll be also focusing and telling you about some of the difficulties and how we get around it for uh, measuring this weak lensing effect. Uh, we can also do it in, in uh, clusters of galaxies, so clusters of the largest uh, overdensities uh, in bound objects in the universe. Uh, we can also use these clusters and measure the lensing effect. Here you see the very, these arcs are the very strong distortions in background galaxies, uh, images coming from the cluster of galaxy here, one of the <coughs> largest clusters called Abel 2218. We can map these clusters, we can measure their mass, and then we can count the number of clusters as a function of mass, as a function of redshift, and study them. We can also study clusters uh, in, the extra, in other wavelengths, either in the optical by looking at galaxy members. We can, the, the purple here is an X-ray intensity map that shows the X-ray gas, which also gives a measure of mass. Uh, so another co uh, cosmological probe uh, is by counting and looking at the statistical properties and the, f the, the distributions of clusters of galaxies through lensing and through various other probes as well. And finally, the last uh, probe, which is a purely geometrical probe, is, is a supernovae, uh, which, are, uh, which are used. And um, so supernovae are basically uh, explosions, very, very energetic explosions of stars at different stages. Uh, and it turns out that these uh, stars, have the, these explosions are very regular. So we see them as variable objects with the light curves as typically like this as a function of time. This is the brightness. After some rescaling, they have very regular properties and they can be thought as a standard candle. So you can, after some processing, you can think of them all having the same luminosity. So if you, can, if you can measure the luminosity, you get a measure of distance, at least up to a, a factor. And then you can plot what is called the Hubble diagram, which is the redshift of the supernova as a function of its, of its uh, effective distance, basically. It's called the Hubble diagram, and you can compare with different models with different amounts of dark energy and so on. This is a classic paper uh, by Perimeter uh, et al. There's now much better measurements than, than this. Uh, and from this, you can constrain the cosmological model and, in fact, infer uh, uh, both uh, the amount of dark energy and the, um, uh, and the uh, statistical properties uh, and the equation of state of dark energy. So together, by combining all of this information, uh, we basically uh, arrived at what I, called, what I discussed before, the lambda CDN model, which is basically the standard model of, particle, of uh, cosmology which has a cosmological constant, cold dark matter, uh, baryons, which are basically standard model of particle physics particles, uh, and as well as photons and, and, and uh, relativistic particle radiation, inflation, and general relativity. And all of that combined is extremely well constrained and, and fits basically uh, most or all the observations, at least on scale larger than galactic scales. On scale smaller than galactic scales, the astrophysics becomes more complicated, uh, and there's some discrepancies, and there's a lot of research trying to find out whether it's because of astrophysical effect or failure of the model. And this is only the beginning because we have a large number of instruments that are being uh, planned or are ongoing, just started to be uh, operational uh, to make even, even more precise measurement of all the statistics I showed you before. There are further experiments uh, of the cosmic microwave background that are ongoing, especially for the polarization. There's a large number of experiments in the visible and the near infrared, both with imaging and spectroscopies, which will measure both the weak lensing, the density perturbations of galaxies, and many other, and X-rays and so on. Uh, actually, that's not visible in the infrared, but there are also X-ray experiments planned as well. Uh, with ever and ever precision, basically, we're going to get uh, effectively a full sky distribution of galaxies over very wide relative ranges in the next uh, five to 10 years. And in this coming year, there'll be a lot, lot of new results coming out for some of, these, uh, some of these experiments. There's also a very interesting development in the radio with various experiments uh, being planned, including the GMRT uh, in India and SKA, which uh, India has joined. Uh, which a way of probing the large scale structure, this time not in the visible light or near infrared, but in the radio, using in particular the 21 centimeter line, which traces neutral hydrogen. This is a very interesting uh, frontier for these large scale structure measurements. One can also do lensing in the radio, by the way. Uh, I won't have time to talk much about it, but it's also very exciting. So, to conclude, we now have a model of cosmological lambda CDM which is in very good agreement with the observations. 
through the measurement of various cosmological probes. So it works very well. It observes, uh, it, it basically agrees with all the observations, or most of the observations. It's very successful. But as you see, it leaves a number of fundamental questions wide open. What's the nature of dark matter? What's the nature of the even more puzzling dark energy? Is, does gravity, uh, is ge general relativity valid on very large scales, or does it need to be modified? Is inflation the right theory, and which implementation is important? Does it really explain all the problems it's trying to solve? So even though we've learned a lot, we have uh, basically uncovered a very large number of fundamental uh, questions in physics, which are thought as to be some of the most pressing questions in fundamental phys physics right now. And weak lensing has a special place uh, in these measurements. Uh, as it directly allows us to measure the, um, the dark matter distribution, the mass fluctuation, and as we'll see, is, is uh, very sensitive to dark energy and can, be can uh, give very strong constraint on dark energy. So we'll be focusing on uh, weak lensing in the course. So to conclude, this is the outline of the course that uh, Anjan sent you. Um, and basically, we'll be alternating between lectures from Anjan and I. Uh, Anjan will be focusing on the cosmological model, the physics of the cosmological model, um, through its uh, theory and the basic principles, both uh, the, um, the uh, expansion of the background uh, and density perturbations. And I will be focusing on weak lensing, giving you the physics of the weak lensing, how we measure it, the current status, the implication on our cosmological model, and so on. So I hope you'll enjoy the course. I'm certainly very happy to be here. Uh, and I'll see you uh, throughout this week. So I thank you very much for your attention.